If you're looking to get started in real estate photography, then this is the video for you. Because in this video, I'm going to go over all of the different gear that you will need, the many camera settings that you'll want to use, all of the different tips and tricks for shooting that no one seems to talk about, and of course, all of the essentials you'll need to edit these photos. And by the end of this video, you'll be able to take high quality professional real estate photos that look not just at home, we might say on any real estate listing website, but also photos that realtors, clients, and you yourself will be happy with. So without further ado, let's get into it. So let's talk about the gear you will need for real estate photography. I'm going to talk through both the gear that I own and use to do real estate and also recommend some other options I think that exist that are maybe more affordable or more approachable depending on where you're starting in your journey. In either case, links to all of the gear I talk about will be in the description below and definitely feel free to ask me any questions you have around gear, particularly for those of you that are either thinking about or are shooting on Sony cameras because I probably have some specific thoughts and recommendations that might be useful in that department. Now I would say among different photo and video related gigs, real estate actually is one that requires a pretty minimal amount of gear. At its most basic level, you're really going to need a camera, a lens, and a tripod. But more specifically, let's talk about what each of those actually means and what qualities you're going to need out of a camera, lens, and tripod. So when it comes to cameras, really you're going to want to have an interchangeable lens, DSLR, or mirrorless camera to do real estate photos. Yes, this does mean you're somewhat venturing into a world of slightly more expensive cameras than say any traditional point and shoot, but this does not need to be that expensive. So I personally shoot with the Sony a7 IV, which you can see beside me here, and this is a great full-frame interchangeable lens camera that offers a 33 megapixel sensor and is really right at home doing both photo and video work. That said, this camera itself retails for around $2,500 US at the time of recording this video, and I don't think you need to spend nearly this much to get a great camera to do real estate. Yes, even something as affordable as Canon's Rebel series or the Sony a6000 series cameras can really be an excellent option in terms of getting into real estate photos, and more specifically offers the two key attributes that that you need for any camera to do real estate. One of these being that they are an interchangeable lens camera, meaning that you can change and swap different lenses onto and off of the body, because yes, we're going to need a very specific type of lens or selection of lenses that we'll want to use to get good photos with real estate. And number two, you will need a camera that has the specific feature of auto exposure bracketing, or what's also sometimes abbreviated as AEB. And so this is going to be another critical feature you'll want for any camera that will shoot real estate. Now there is one other factor we'll want to consider with camera selection, and that is of course the sensor size. The Sony a7 IV is a full frame mirrorless camera, meaning it has a sensor that is a bit larger than some others that lets in a bit more light and therefore allows for a bit better dynamic range and also has maybe a larger selection of lenses that are available at the full frame level compared to others. That said, I really also think APS-C crop cameras, which tend to be at a 1.5 to 1.6 times crop, depending on what manufacturer you're going with, are another excellent option for cameras and that tend to be a bit more affordable while also still allowing for a good lens selection and letting in enough light to take great quality images. Yes, there are other smaller sensor sizes like micro four thirds or larger medium format cameras. I would largely stick to either full frame or APS-C. And if you're looking at the APS-C realm, I would probably say the Sony ZV-E10 or even something like the A6400 are great options for this that are pretty affordable. And if you do wish to spend a bit more money to get a camera that can do a bit more, perhaps like I have with these cameras, you can also get something like the Sony A7 III, which is a predecessor to the A7 IV that is an excellent excellent photo and video camera still that has everything we would need to do real estate. Again, links to all of these different camera options I just mentioned will be in the description below. But once you've selected a camera, you're going to then need to pick a lens to use for real estate. And this is going to be an interesting discussion depending on your preferences here, and also depending on the sensor size we selected for our camera. So on the full frame side of things, again, considering my a7 IV, there are two primary lenses I would consider using and recommending for any type of real estate work. The first is going to be a wide angle zoom, specifically a 16 to 35 millimeter, and I personally own the 16 to 35 millimeter f 2.8 G Master lens. And while f 2.8 aperture zooms tend to be among the premium selection that most manufacturers offer, I would say this is actually still more than you need to do real estate. Needless to say, it's actually the focal length that is even going to be more important here because we do want to get really, really wide shots. And sometimes getting the largest perspective of a room, you're going to need a really wide angle lens to do this. A 16 to 35 is going to let you get really wide at the 16 millimeter end but also punch in closer at around 20, 24, and even up to 35 millimeters when you want to get tighter details on a room. And this allows you a lot of flexibility with being able to adjust your shot without having to move your tripod or your camera from where it's located. Now again, if you don't wish to splurge for something as pricey as the G Master 16 to 35 and you're in the Sony system, you can also look at something like Sony's new 16 to 35 millimeter F4 PZ lens, which is another great option that is a bit smaller and lighter and probably around half the cost of the G Master. And Sony also makes a 16 
seen a 35mm f4 Zeiss lens that is also great in this range. Of course, I'd be remiss in talking about zoom lenses and not mentioning the 12 to 24mm focal length. This is definitely a popular lens with real estate photographers, however, it is on the pricier side, and these lenses' convex design often means they're a bit more difficult to adapt filters to. So while this lens is a great choice for real estate, I would usually recommend waiting a bit later before picking one of these up, and perhaps starting out with a bit more versatile of a focal length. But these lenses are ideal for full-frame cameras, and these would actually be a lot tighter of a field of view if we were to put them on an APS-C camera. So yes, a 16 to 35 would technically become a 24 to 52.5 millimeter if we were putting it, say, on one of Sony's APS-C crop cameras. Therefore, if you're someone that's getting a more affordable APS-C crop camera, you're going to want to get a specific zoom lens that works with this size sensor. My recommendations here would be Sony's 10 to 20 G f4 PZ lens, which is a great option at the APS-C crop factor level. And again, this 10 to 20 isn't actually 10 to 20. It's really something you can think of as, again, a 15 to 30 when you put this on an APS-C. PSC crop camera. Another great option that's very affordable here is the 10 to 18 f4 zoom lens for Sony cameras, but zoom lenses are also just one option here because there are also prime lenses which offer a fixed focal length versus say the sort of difference that you'd have with the zoom where you can go back and forth between different focal length values. Prime lenses tend to be a bit smaller and compact and sometimes can be a bit more affordable, and if you're wondering if you can use a prime lens to real estate or someone has told you maybe that they're not ideal for it, I would actually beg to differ. And I say this because specifically as Perhaps you can see on my camera here, I have a prime lens, and in fact, a lot of the examples I'm going to go through in this video were shot with specifically, yes, a prime lens. The prime lens that I've used for real estate with my a7 IV is the 20mm f1.8G lens, and this is a great lightweight portable prime lens that is useful in a lot of different contexts, and yes, real estate, I would say, is one of them. While it cannot go quite as wide as a 16mm, again, if you have the ability to just back up your tripod a bit and or move it forward to get a bit closer to whatever you're shooting, you can usually accommodate for this pretty easily. And I would say for any Sony shooters out there, Sony's 20mm G or their 14mm G Master are going to be excellent options for real estate. Now again, these are lenses that I would recommend for full-frame cameras like my a7 IV. If you're looking for something that works well with Sony's APS-C cameras, I would say their 11mm f1.8 lens is a great option for this. And yes, maybe even another good option here is the Sigma 16mm f1.4 lens. I actually owned this lens for a period of time with my a6500 back in the day, and this was an excellent lens. If you have any questions around lens selection or what each different focal length comes out to be when you're adapting it to a different sensor size or a different type of lens, let me know in the comments below. But once you picked out a camera and a lens, we're going to want to talk about tripods, and there are a few key things we'll want to consider with tripods as well. So as someone that shoots both photo and video, I really tend to prefer fluid head tripods that are actually meant for video use. And this is because of a couple reasons. Number one, fluid heads offer a really smooth way to be able to pan and tilt when you're using the tripod. Also because because fluid head tripods are really built and designed for video use, in terms of the horizontal or landscape access, this tripod will pretty much always be level left to right if and when you extend its legs out consistently across them, and so that's one less thing you generally have to worry about when setting up your shots. Now my preferred tripod for both photo and video work is the Manfrotto 290 Extra Series legs with the 128RC head. This can accommodate pretty much any DSLR or mirrorless camera and lens combination that's out there today. It can perform really smooth pans and tilts if you need it to, say for video work, and being very affordable at around a little over $200 US, it is a solid piece of gear that I would trust my more expensive cameras and lenses on, and that has become really my go-to workhorse for almost any sort of gig, including real estate photography. Many of Manfrotto and other tripod systems also come with removable plates that allow you to easily pop on and off your cameras and lenses from them, so changing cameras with these tripods or needing to remove them and swap them out if and when you need to becomes a very quick operation itself, which is helpful. I have reviewed this tripod on this channel, so I will leave a link above to that, and in the description below if you want to check that out. I do think Manfrotto offers a great selection, and so there's a number of options out there that would also be good for this. Bonus points if your tripod does have a built-in level with the head, though I don't think you necessarily need this because most cameras do have a built-in level that will be generally adequate enough for being able to frame up your shot. Again, we'll talk about that later in the camera settings section. Now, if you're choosing to go with a bit smaller APS-C camera and perhaps a smaller lens with that as well, I would say you could get away with a much smaller and maybe more compact tripod. I also do own the Manfrotto Compact Action 
action tripod, which is sort of great for these APS-C bodies and smaller lenses that exist out there. And this comes in at around a third of the cost of the 290 Extra Series legs and 128RC head that I mentioned earlier. The compact action tripod does not have a fluid head and has a much lower weight limit, but it is an affordable and budget-friendly option if you need it. That said, if you're intending to do this semi-professionally or professionally, I wouldn't skimp on a tripod. So I would say getting a good tripod goes a long way here. And once you've picked out a camera, lens, and a tripod, you basically have all of the gear that you will need. Well, maybe except for memory cards. And while that might go without saying, yes, getting good memory cards for your camera is also of importance, I tend to prefer SanDisk's V30 cards for most cameras, especially if you're only going to use them for photo work. Though for cameras like my a7 IV that shoot higher quality video and need a card specification that can handle that, I really tend to prefer Prograde's V90 cards for this. If you're only going to be taking photos with your camera or very, very small video clips maybe here and there, I would say 64 gigs is plenty in terms of a card size to choose. That said, if you're expecting to do more hybrid work, say 50% photo, 50% video, or want to lean into video more heavily at some point, I would say looking into a card size like 128 or 256 gigabytes is going to be what you'll want to consider. Again, links to the SD cards I'd recommend here will be in the description below. Now, circular polarizer filters are great for being able to cut down any harsh reflections on surfaces like glass, wood, or other similar finishes. I'm a big fan of the Polar Pro Quartzline circular polarizer, and so this is definitely something I'd recommend picking up, though I will say you can probably get by on a fair number of real estate photography jobs without one of these. Okay, now we've actually covered all of the gear that we will need, I promise. But once we've acquired the gear we need that will become our real estate photography kit that we'll use to take photos, we're going to need to set up our camera to shoot real estate photography with a number of different settings that will be important for this type of work. So let's cover all the different camera settings you're going to want to use to shoot real estate photography. Now, of course, the different menu selections and options and buttons and so on are going to vary between the different camera makes and models. Needless to say, I would focus more so on the general concepts and options that I am selecting here and not get too specific about where I go into the different menu system to set something. Though, of course, for anyone with the Sony a7 IV or a newer Sony camera, this will probably be very relevant to you. So, of course, I will first put my camera into its photo mode and more specifically, if you'd like to at this point, can also set it to the A or aperture priority setting in the camera. And I will go into a bit more detail why I choose that specifically here in a moment. Now, this might go without saying, but yes, we're going to be taking horizontal or landscape orientation real estate photos, not portrait or vertical. This just tends to work better with most multiple listing service sites and is going to be what realtors expect. So yes, we're going to be using our camera in landscape orientation essentially 100% of the time. Though before I set my camera to do auto exposure bracketing or AEB, as we mentioned earlier, you do have to turn off any picture profiles you're using in the camera to shoot bracketed images. A fun fact here with Sony cameras is that when you turn off the picture profile and you are taking photos, you are to some degree still utilizing a picture profile, technically the stills gamma, which tends to be a bit more contrasty and punchy in terms of getting different color out of the camera. This looks fine for taking photos, and again, isn't going to matter too much by the time we edit these later, but just something to keep in mind. Now, before we set the camera up for auto exposure bracketing, I want to talk a bit about why we're choosing to set the camera up in this way, and maybe some of the other different options that exist for doing real estate photography that are out there. So choosing to shoot brackets or AEB, etc., really is just one way of doing real estate. There are a number of folks out there that choose to use flash or sort of a mixture of flash and ambient light, also known as flambient, which you might hear from time to time. Really, any of these options are valid for taking great quality real estate photos, and you're going to get different opinions and perspectives depending on different real estate shooters and who prefers doing what. Now, in terms of why I'm going to recommend auto exposure brackets and why I do this personally for real estate photos, I'll mention a few key reasons. With bracketed images, what we're essentially doing is taking multiple shots at different exposure levels. So say a normal exposed shot, one that is minus two stops underexposed, one that is minus four stops underexposed, one that is plus two stops overexposed, and one that is plus four stops overexposed, and ultimately going to combine these five images into one high dynamic range or HDR image in post. By doing this, what we're able to do is still capture a wide amount of dynamic range that captures the brightest parts and the deepest shadows of our image, while being able to shoot this pretty quickly in the real world and edit this in a pretty consistent way too in post when we go into Lightroom. Taking multiple bracketed images that form a high dynamic range picture in the end is a workflow that works best for me and I think actually works well for a lot of photographers today. So once we've turned our picture profile off in the camera, we can now set it up to take auto exposure bracketed images. So when I shoot bracketed images for real estate, I do this with a two stops difference of exposure with five total images or the 2.0 EV5 option in the Sony cameras as you're now seeing on screen. Yes, there are options that take only three bracketed images with larger stops of exposure 
part. I personally find doing five brackets at two stops difference works best for the work that I do, though you can play around with different options here if you wish to maybe shoot less photos and save card size, or just experiment with what you think works best and looks best to you. One thing I also do explicitly set up is a self timer during bracket. I usually set this to just two seconds, though you can choose a larger duration like five seconds if and when you need to. And what this allows me to do is basically have a timer go off when I hit the shutter button that provides really a couple of benefits. Number one, every time you hit the shutter button, your camera is going to shake slightly even when on a tripod. And so this provides a little extra time for that shot and your camera to stable out by the time it takes the photos. And number two, you might encounter a lot of cases where you're say in a room with a mirror or something where you need to have enough time to get out of frame so that you're not in the image. So providing a little extra time there from when you hit the shutter button to when your camera takes the photos is something that's going to be likely useful. And there are other options for being able to trigger your shutter button remotely, say with different IR remotes or different camera apps like the Sony Imaging Edge app, though I found for the gigs I've been doing, the self-timer option works fine for this. Now when it comes to autofocus versus manual focus, I am someone that will say to typically go with autofocus so long as you have a good newer camera, like a Sony, like a Canon that has a nice phase detection autofocus system. Again, because you're going to be at a more closed aperture value anyway, which yes, we'll get to shortly, you're not going to find autofocus needs to do much here other than just basically lock onto something and do so predictably and consistently. And my Sony cameras, when I'm shooting real estate photos, I am normally doing AFS or autofocus single shot in the wide focus area. Again, because rooms of course are typically wide and we want to be able to have the autofocus lock onto any part of the room as needed. That said, you can explore other options like center or zone if you need to fixate on a specific point while ignoring another, though I find wide works generally really well for this. And yes, with something like AFS and wide, you should see that even just testing this out quickly, either with a half press of your shutter button or taking an actual image, your focus should lock onto a given part of the room. And again, because we'll be changing our aperture to a larger value here in a moment, this will mean whatever it locks onto is going to be pretty much the entirety of the room, which should be in focus. Now, yes, there are other autofocus modes like autofocus automatic, or yes, even manual focus, which I would say is an option if you're working with a camera that does not have a good autofocus system. If you're going to go the manual focus route, I would definitely recommend doing something like focus peaking to ensure that whatever you're manually focusing on is actually in focus. If you're a Sony user that is deciding to explore the manual focus route, I have a separate video on this channel that I will link to above and in the description below that shows some of the different tips and tricks I use when doing manual focus. Now, when it comes to the actual exposure settings that I use, which of course pertains to shutter speed, aperture, and ISO, there are a few things I will tell you, at least with regard to the cameras I use and what I would recommend for real estate. With ISO, I'm usually going to keep this as low as I can, depending on the different lighting conditions that I'm in. So for example, you will see me start with a base ISO of 100, which is the lowest it can go when the picture profile is turned off in my a7 IV. Though that said, as you start to encounter darker areas and other situations where you need to boost the ISO and get more light out of your camera, I will find that I will adjust this, say, maybe to four or 500, even to 800 or 1000 ISO. Really, in terms of how much you can push this, it's going to vary, and it's going to be something you'll want to test out per camera and per make and model. For any a7 IV users out there, I do have a separate video on ISO you can check out that tells you about the dual ISO system that exists in the a7 IV and what some of the different values are you can target here at the low and high end, depending on what you're doing. With most cameras, I would be definitely a bit cautious going above 800 or 1000 ISO and certainly would test anything going, say, to 2500 or 3200 and above. Now let's talk about aperture and why we specifically chose to use aperture priority in the camera. Choosing aperture priority in our camera means that it's going to stay fixed at the aperture value we select and compensate with other aspects of our exposure, such as shutter speed, to be able to keep this aperture value. Again, with aperture number, the lower the value you get, the less that will be in focus, and the more you'll have this sort of shallow depth of field effect, whereas the higher the aperture number, the more that will be in focus in your shot. Because with real estate, you typically want to see the entirety of the room or the house or whatever you're shooting, you will generally want to stick with a higher aperture number than you might choose if you were shooting something else like weddings or events and so on. There are a lot of different schools of thought here around aperture. I've seen people go as low as f5.6 to as high as f16 for something like this. I tend to personally use f8 for shooting almost all of my different real estate photos, whether interiors or exteriors. And I think this tends to really work well where essentially anything maybe more than say a foot and a half is in focus within the shot. And this allows for getting the entirety of the room and being able to capture a really nice looking image while still allowing in just enough light to keep aspects like shutter speed and ISO at reasonable levels. That said, you can play around with other aperture values if you so choose and decide to maybe go for a slightly different look. Now, what you'll notice in aperture priority mode is that once we set our aperture value up to a given value, our shutter speed is going to start to compensate for this larger aperture number and we'll specifically get into a territory of some pretty 
pretty small and low value shutter speeds. Usually the risk or caution here is of course that the lower the shutter speed, the more motion blur we'll get in our image. And of course we don't want necessarily any blur in our real estate photos. We want them to be pretty crisp and clean. That is ultimately why we're going to want to shoot these images with a tripod and pretty much only with a tripod and nothing handheld or anything to ensure that we keep a consistent and stable shot as we move through our different bracketed images. And so even as the camera adjusts exposure for some of these different images, particularly in these lower exposure brackets when it has to make the shutter speed pretty slow, that the shot is still going to be solid end to end. Now when it comes to white balance or essentially telling our camera what is true white when we're shooting our images, this is going to be something I'm going to typically recommend most folks just use auto white balance in their camera for. Most modern day cameras like Sony's and Canon's have a decent enough auto white balance function to be able to assess what this should be when you enter the room. And even if this value is slightly off, it should be relatively trivial to correct this in post as we'll demonstrate later. If you're someone that wants to do manual white balance, and I could probably do a whole different video on this later to cover, I would say that that's definitely something that's going to be more useful on the video front than with photos. That said, if you're doing manual white balance, I would really just be mindful of the different colors and temperatures that are often going on when you're shooting a house. Typical tungsten or incandescent bulbs tend to be around 3200 Kelvin, while daylight tends to be around 5600 Kelvin. And if you're shooting a house that has sort of a different mixture of these color temperatures going on, you might want to land somewhere in the middle, say around 4500 Kelvin to get a relatively balanced color temperature. That said, some homes may use daylit balance bulbs to where everything in your shot is around 5600 Kelvin, or you might have a very cloudy day if you're shooting an exterior, where this might even need to be at a temperature around 6 or 7000 Kelvin. Again, if all of this sounds foreign to you, I would stick with auto white balance and focus on learning manual white balance later. Now, a lot of cameras do have a built-in stabilization system. I know in my a7 IV, we have both the steady shot standard system and the steady shot active system. In this case, active tends to be more for handheld shooting, but if your camera just has a basic stabilization setting like the steady shot standard in most Sony's, I do personally leave this on and would recommend it as this is something that along with your tripod and some of these other measures we mentioned will help keep your shots steady and stable between all of the different brackets you're taking. Now, when your camera is taking its different bracketed photos, it's going to be doing so in assessing the relative exposure of your image using the multimeter that comes with your camera. With Sony cameras, I would tend to just recommend leaving this on the multi setting because this is going to allow for enough relative assessing of the exposure of the room that you're in and being able to figure out the differences in exposure as it goes through the brackets. You can also choose options like the center or spot if you need to focus on a particular part of your image to gauge its exposure, but I tend to think that the multi mode is fine for this. And because of how we're going to generally be taking images, which I'll mention in a moment here, you should have more than enough room to play with exposure if and when you need to in post. And the last thing we're going to cover here is the actual image quality settings that I use to take these photos and that you might want to consider when taking real estate photos. So I'll do a brief summary here of what I use and then maybe explain some options here you might have. In particular, I tend to shoot both RAW and JPEG photos when doing real estate and actually most gigs in terms of photography. I do use the lossy compressed RAW option in terms of the different options there, which we'll talk through. JPEG quality I keep at extra fine and I do keep the JPEG image size at the full size of the sensor, which in the case of the a7 IV is 30 33 megapixels. Now, why should you maybe shoot RAW and or JPEG? First things first, have I shot only JPEG before and does it work? Yes, and I have done this even specifically for real estate. And because you're shooting multiple bracketed images, this is still going to give you a decent amount of dynamic range, even with a lossy, less quality format like JPEGs are. In terms of shooting RAW, of course, RAW is going to allow for the most flexibility in being able to grade this image in post, say when we do this in Lightroom later. Again, because we're shooting multiple images, this does make it a bit less crucial, say if we were doing something like a wedding where we have one chance to get one single shot. And needless to say, I shoot both RAW and JPEG, so the JPEGs give me flexibility if I need to quickly pull a photo for a realtor or someone, and that the raw photos will be ultimately what I use to grade and deliver these images later. For raw format, I'm not going to get into the true specifics between uncompressed versus lossy compressed versus lossless uncompressed. I found there to be an extremely negligible to really unnoticeable difference in terms of choosing the lossy compressed raw option, and so I tend to do this just to save a bit of space, and I find that I still get more than enough latitude to edit these images later, just as raw images should offer, so this works well for me. JPEG quality I usually keep at extra fine or the highest quality setting option because JPEG tends to be a bit more of a lossy format anyway, and so I prefer getting something a bit higher resolution with this. And I do keep the JPEG image size at the full megapixel value of the sensor, though yes, you can also play around with smaller ones here. Bear in mind, we'll show this later, we're going to have to actually shrink these images a fair amount on export in terms of their size and quality just to meet the standard specifications of at least the US's multiple listing service. Though I still find keeping the full megapixel value gives us a lot of room to 
crop into our image or manipulate it a bit more if we need to, say in Lightroom, and it's going to give us a lot more flexibility than if we were to start with a much smaller megapixel image that we're capturing from the camera. So yes, there's a lot of options in terms of image quality settings, and I've played around with these a fair amount myself, but what you see here and what I covered tends to be what I'm going with, at least for most real estate photography gigs as of this point. All right, so now that we've got all of our gear squared away and our camera settings are good to go, we are now ready to shoot some real estate photos. So let's talk about the many different tips and tricks that I don't hear many people talking about when it comes to actually shooting real estate, but I believe are actually fundamental and critical for getting good quality shots. So we're going to account for both exteriors and interiors here, but because there is a fair amount of overlap and some underlying concepts that exist between the two, I'm going to cover what I would consider my general set of shooting rules when it comes to real estate photography. Bear in mind, this is just my opinion and what I've been going with as I've been shooting real estate photos, and these are not something you have to necessarily strictly adhere to 100% of the time, but I think they will be a useful guide when it comes to getting quality consistent photos. So let's first talk about tripod height. When it comes to shooting exteriors, you're going to want to get typically as much height as you can get out of your tripod. Now with my Manfrotto 290 Extra and 128RC, this ends up being at around 63 inches or a little over five feet or so, maybe a little less than a meter and a half for those not based in the US. And this is ultimately so we can go as tall as we can to counterbalance the ultimate height of the home we're shooting. Yes, even in the case of a single story house, this is going to be pretty tall and much taller than whatever you're shooting on an interior, particularly once you consider the roof line or if you're dealing with a multi-story home or yes, even a much larger apartment or condo complex. So getting a good amount of height when you're shooting your exteriors is going to be pretty critical. Now, when it comes to your interior shots, this is where this is going to get a bit interesting. A lot of photographers are pretty accustomed to taking photos from whatever their main height and eye line is. So for myself, I'm five foot nine inches and typically this means I'm taking photos from in and around that height pretty much regardless of what gig I'm doing. But this is not what you're going to want to do for real estate and particularly for interior photos. That is because when it comes to height with interiors, and this is also true of exteriors, we typically want a balance between floor and ceiling space. And oftentimes with homes in the US, which typically have a ceiling height around eight or nine feet, you're going to find that shooting around your eye line or where you typically stand is going to provide way too much floor space and not enough ceiling space. What I find is a good rule of thumb is typically taking photos from around where your waistline is. And so for myself, the somewhere falls in the 36 to 42 inch range, or maybe around a meter or so, again, for our non-US folks. However, However, again, particularly with interiors, there's going to be one case where I will regularly break this height rule, and that comes with any room like a kitchen or bathroom that has counters or countertops. In rooms like this, typically the eye line is going to be set a bit differently, and so in this case, we want to be able to see some form of the counters and or the sink and a little bit of the lip of the sink from below it. So usually in this case, I'm extending my tripod height a bit, say another six to 12 inches or so, to be able to accommodate this difference in perspective and ensure I'm not just looking at the side of the cabinet. So I'm Shooting. Now, how low is too low or how high is too high? Again, you're gonna see some different examples here. I would say it's something definitely worth playing around with and that you're going to get more and more comfortable with when you're shooting. Also bear in mind, these rules around height might change if you encounter a larger room, like something with a vaulted ceiling that is beyond the standard height of a room. But there is another rule related to height we're going to want to consider, which is typically what is known as keeping our verticals vertical. So what does this ultimately mean? In a given house, you're typically going to have right angles or walls. And where these walls meet is what is going to represent, well, what should be a vertical line. What we're going to want to do when we compose our shot is ensure that these lines where the walls meet up or other vertical surfaces like where windows are or cabinets are actually oriented vertically. So yes, if you're aiming your tripod too low or too high, you're going to see that these vertical lines will not be vertical end to end. And so regardless of just setting your height on your tripod, you're going to want to make sure that the way your camera is pointing regarding its height is doing so, so that you keep your vertical lines vertical. One thing I normally do my Sony cameras that helps me maintain this is by setting my C4 or trash can button to be the zoom magnify option. Setting this not just allows me to quickly zoom into my image to get a very fine read on a vertical surface, but also has a kind of plus symbol guide that allows me to run up and down the image quickly to see if and how vertical my lines are. Again, I talk a lot more about setting this up in my other video around manual focus tips and tricks, so I would highly encourage you to check that out if you want to set up something similar in your camera. Of course, the built-in level of your camera should be another useful 
tool in helping make sure your verticals are vertical and that your height is as it should be. Again, this needn't perfectly match, but it is something that should be a useful tool and should help line up the image enough so that you'll be able to get it in an even more pristine shape once we bring it into Lightroom to edit later. Now, when it comes to assessing the overall width of your image or essentially how to compose a shot with that regard, I would say mostly if and where you can just try to keep things symmetrical. If you have a room that is relatively even on either side, try to compose your shot so that it looks that way. If you're shooting something like the exterior of a house, yes, the house should generally be in the center of the frame and should have relatively even space on either side. Something like the rule of thirds and applying a three by three grid over your image, which you can set up in at least Sony's cameras might be a helpful tool in being able to assess this. But yes, keeping things relatively even and symmetrical should help draw the eye towards what it should be. Now again, might there be some awkward shaped rooms where in order to capture them correctly, you're going to have to break some of these rules. Yes, this does and will happen, but by and large, these should be general compositional rules you can adhere to when you're shooting both interiors and exteriors. But now you might be wondering what kinds of shots should you get both on the exterior and interior front, so we should discuss that. Most standard packages around shooting homes will typically have you deliver at least a minimum of 25 photos, maybe more towards 40 or 50 on the larger end. Of course, if you're entering the luxury real estate market, this is going to go well up from there and include other things like aerial coverage and or video work, which is something we're not going to explicitly cover here, but let me know if you'd like to see that in a future video. But with the number of photos in and around this, I'm going to say anywhere between 10 to 20% of your photos should generally be balanced with exterior shots, and the overwhelming majority being the remainder focused on interiors. When it comes to exteriors, I'm usually looking for just a few key standard shots. Yes, definitely get the front of the house, of course, both at a left and right angle, and usually dead on center. I usually get these fairly wide, and then we'll definitely go in tight, at least for a center frame shot. This can also be a good opportunity to get a shot of just the door or porch or entryway if it is particularly notable in that house. Usually one of these shots you take is going to be the main or lead shot that clients see, so this is definitely going to be an important one. Of course, buyers and realtors often also want to show the rear of the home, so getting shots of the rear of the house, again, centered and or framed from a left or right angle are going to be useful here as well. If there is a yard to speak of there, I would get at least one center frame shot, or if it's a particularly wide yard, maybe just left and right framed angles. In most cases, we're not going to be concerned with capturing the sides of the house, again, unless we're working with a much larger and more expensive property, but usually some assortment of shots here is going to be valuable. Also, if there is something like a deck or porch that is unique about the house, being able to capture this and or at least a view looking down from it can also be helpful. In this case, I'm mostly assuming these shots are being taken during the day because you're going to usually want them to be when there is some form of daylight going on. Though another popular shot you're going to see a lot with exteriors that is a bit more unique is what's known typically as the twilight shot. This is usually when you capture the house in and around sunset and by lighting it up through the different rooms and having all the lights on in the home, it has a nice kind of warm glow to it. Now, if you're shooting a twilight photo for a house, what I would typically do to raise the ambient light of the rooms in the home is take something like my Aperture ALF7s or my Aperture MCs, each of which I own two of, place them at around 3200 Kelvin or so, or whatever specific color temperature the lights in the room already are, and boost them to their maximum intensity, placing them in and around where the windows are. For rooms that don't have enough light going on or don't have, say, a major fixture or chandelier that puts out enough light, this is going to help raise the lighting of those rooms so that you get that nice golden look throughout all of the windows of the home and can really help with making that twilight shot stand out a bit more than usual. Now, when it comes to your interior shots and compositional rules, how should you set these up? I have a number of thoughts here that I will mention. So yes, of course, get all the rooms, all of the main living areas, kitchens, bathrooms, bedrooms, you name it. It can also be a value here to get the garage or things like a basement or utility areas because you never know necessarily what one realtor might want that another might not or what a potential buyer might might want to see if they contact the agent, even if that photo doesn't go up on the MLS. In terms of rooms to focus on more than others, in terms of getting additional shots, I would certainly say the kitchen in most homes is certainly of importance, as are some of the main living and dining areas. Also, of course, the master suite being the bedroom, bathroom, and any closets, especially if they're walk-ins. Additional spaces like secondary bedrooms and bathrooms, an office, or other sorts of ancillary parts of the home are always good to capture, of course, but you can get a few less shots here if and when you need to, or especially if you're going to be later picking shots out to deliver. For most of those main living areas, I'm usually looking at a few different rules I'm applying when I'm thinking of shots to get. If nothing else, corners are a great natural point of being able to capture a room. This is particularly true for more traditionally square or rectangle rooms 
like bedrooms, living areas, and such. At a minimum, getting a shot in one corner of the room and then looking diagonally or 180 degrees over and getting that other shot from the other side is a good model you can follow. To me personally, even more useful than that can be using doorways and general doors as a good entry point to capturing photos of a room. Number one, because this is where most people are going to typically enter and see the rooms themselves. But number two, particularly if you have a given lens that you're working with and say maybe the focal length is a bit tighter, this is a natural entry point where you can use to back up a bit to get a bit more perspective of the room or even use the door frame to convey a bit of depth when looking into the room. For those rooms that are also more center framed in terms of how they're laid out and oriented, I would definitely say you could take a dead on center shot of a room if it warrants it. Certain homes and properties might just lend themselves to these sort of different shot ideas. Other ones you might have to play around with a bit. And again, this is something you should get more comfortable with in time. Certainly for those rooms that are a bit larger and harder to capture or even parts of a room, say if you have a very large kitchen, you can take some more focused shots of a section of that room and then take one of the whole as well to help convey the overall space. One other tip that I'm going to mention too here is in terms of getting shots or doing what you need to to be able to get the shot is, well, get awkward. Yes, as a real estate photographer, it is your job to get in sort of these awkward angles or positions to be able to capture the room properly. That might mean you need to scrunch up your tripod legs to be able to position the camera in such a way so that you can capture the entire room. That might mean you need to situate yourself awkwardly in and around or behind the camera to be able to capture the room from a certain vantage point. Basically, do what you have to do within reason to be able to get the shots you need to get. This is maybe one area where a zoom lens offers a bit more latitude compared to a prime lens. Something I would recommend is definitely taking a bit more photos and whatever you're expected to deliver. This is so that you have some options in terms of selecting different photos or trying different ideas. Now to get the house in a sort of ready to go state, this is something that might be or might not be your job, depending on how interactive the realtor wants to be in prepping the homeowners for shooting the house. But we're going to talk at least a bit about staging and some general concepts I think are really important to adhere to. First and foremost, with taking photos, particularly in interior spaces, I want to generally have all of the window shades open as much as they possibly can be and also have any of the lighting fixtures turned on in the house. And even if this means having a mix of different color temperatures, whether desired or not, this is something we can play around with in post, as we'll show later. Now, you might encounter a brand new build with nothing in it, as you've seen in some of these examples, or you might encounter very much what is a lived-in home. And if you're working with the latter and the owners haven't necessarily done their due diligence in getting the home ready to shoot by the time you've gotten there, I would typically recommend trying to reasonably declutter the home as much as possible. Mostly that means getting any extraneous items off of countertops, clearing tables, of anything that shouldn't be there, organizing blankets, toys, or laptops, or anything else that might be out and about on different tables and other surfaces. Yes, making the beds. And if there's any really notable dirty or dusty surfaces, maybe giving them a quick pass as well before you shoot. On the exterior side, try to clean up any trash cans or debris or just any other items that really shouldn't be there, or at the very least, try to frame them out. Also, if you're shooting a home with a driveway, if you have any ability to clear the street, try to clear out any of the extraneous cars that are there if you can. Ultimately, you can only do so much. You're there to capture capture kind of what is the house. Some of these things you might be able to correct a bit in post, other things just aren't necessarily a responsibility. So I would say so long as the window shades are open and the lights are on, you can do sort of a best effort here in terms of helping the owners get the house ready to shoot. Or if you can get the realtor to work with them to do this before you even arrive, that is even better. It doesn't always work out that way, I can tell you. And honestly, once you have these rules down, it is really just a matter of rinse and repeat. So you've bought all of the gear that you need for real estate photography. You've set up your camera with all of the necessary settings to be able to take these photos photos, and you've now taken your first set of photos for real estate. Now comes the part where we're going to edit these photos and get them ready to deliver. For this, we're really going to rely on two primary applications to work with real estate photos. And you're going to find these applications are common, not just in terms of real estate photography work, but frankly, most photographers' workflows. Specifically, we're going to rely on Adobe Lightroom Classic for the vast majority of our real estate photo edits, and also Adobe Photoshop as well for at least one key feature, if not more. These are going to be essential tools for being able to edit these photos and get them ready to go. So Definitely, if you don't have them already, they're going to be something you'll want to pick up. And so without further ado, let's edit our real estate photos. I have a collection here from a few different homes I've shot, and many of these being the photos that you've seen in these examples throughout the video. Yes, these were shot at many different properties, being single family homes and a large or condo complex. So we're going to get a good mixture here of different types of photos in terms of how they were shot technically, but also just different types of properties and different looks you can get when you're shooting them. All right, so let's go over to my MacBook Pro, where on an external drive, I have a number of 
photo save that we're going to use for our samples to show editing real estate photos. So you'll notice that for at least a couple of these, they're going to have raw images that we captured. And then at least in one of these cases, we're going to have JPEG images that we did instead. So I'm going to open up Lightroom Classic here, just in my general list of applications. And as you can see here, I was working on a thumbnail for another video. So we're going to create a new collection that will house all of our different real estate photos here. So once I go over back to the library here, I'm going to go over to File and then do a new catalog. And we're going to call this Real Estate Samples. And this chooses our pictures directory by default to save it to, so we can stick with that. And we will hit Create. Now you'll be presented with some options here in terms of how to back up this catalog and save it by default, but we're just going to leave everything as is and click back up. Now, since we just created a new catalog, Lightroom just opened and sort of reloaded itself. So we can now import the photos we want to edit within this catalog. Down here, I'm going to just go and click import. And you're going to see it shows my entire directory structure here for my external drive. But if these photos were internal, I could browse on my main Macintosh HD to find them as well. In this case, I know they are all in this real estate photography folder. So we're going to dive into that and go into the samples folder. Now, in this case, because I know I want to import photos from all three of these directories, as you see here, I'm just going to click on the first one listed, hold down the shift key, and then just click on the bottom folder there. And at this point, as I scroll through them, I'm going to see photos from all three of those directories. Of course, if you only had one folder, you could just select that and you'd be good to go. Once I've done this, you'll see each of these photos have a check mark next to them which shows that they're going to be imported and so pretty much at this point I can just hit import and let Lightroom do its thing and now we'll wait a bit just for Lightroom to import and come back once that's complete all right and so that didn't take too long at least in this case so our photos are now all imported and as you see here I'm just going to go over to the develop view and you're going to get a decent feel for how this all works so you'll see my first photo I imported of these many collections is just a regularly exposed photo we have the next one after which is minus two stops underexposed we have the next one after that which is the plus two stops overexposed bracket. We have the minus four stops underexposed bracket, and then we have the plus four stops overexposed bracket. And then of course, as we hop to the next photo here, it is going to be the same essential set and sequence of how all of these different photos were taken within the brackets. So what we're going to want to do here is take each of these five photos and essentially merge them into one single high dynamic range image. Now there's a couple of different ways you could go about this, but I find the easiest method to do this is to first take each of the groups of photos and for each, what should be single image, put them into one stack. So basically all of the five differently exposed shots go into one stack per photo. And and then basically take that and do an HDR merge of those different stacks. So in my catalog here, I'm going to hit Command and then the A key so that all of my photos in the catalog are selected. Now, once I've selected all these photos, I'm going to go into Photo, I'm going to go into Stacking, and then I'm going to go to Auto Stack by Capture Time. And so what Lightroom is now going to do is basically take my photos and depending on when they were shot, within how many seconds of each other, group them into different stacks that will help use to merge them together in an HDR image. Now, there's a number of different values you could do for this, you'll see right now we have three seconds set and it shows 20 stacks, but three images that it did not catch in that. If we move this to four seconds, we have 20 stacks and only one image that was unstacked. We'll see we have the same thing with five. Now, if you're too lenient with your stacking time, say at maybe one second or so, you're going to find a lot of shots that were taken longer than one second between each other, say at certain different exposure levels. And so you're going to see certain shots that just don't get stacked together that should. And at the other end, if you choose a stacking time, say of like 10 seconds, you're going to find maybe if you shot a couple of images in quick succession of another that different stacks and different exposures are getting kind of combined together when they shouldn't. So I tend to think an average of around five seconds or so, give or take a second or two is usually good for this. So even though it says one photo here is unstacked, we're going to still go with this and we're going to hit stack. And in this case, you can see it pretty much stacked every single image that I wanted to bring in successfully, except for one photo here. You can see this plus four overexposed photo, and you can actually tell just where it is in the sequence that it belongs to this stack. This is actually pretty easy to correct. If I want, I can just take that stack that has the one missing photo, hold down my shift key and select the other photo. In this case, right click, go to stacking and just say to group into stack. And now all five of these are together. So I normally think it's easiest to just pick a good solid stack time of around five seconds and any that don't get caught quickly bring them into the stack if you notice it. This usually doesn't take too much time to clean up if you need to. That said, now that we have all of our bracketed images stacked correctly together, we can now take these and merge them together as a high dynamic range or HDR image. So to do this, I'm going to again, hold down the command key and select the A letter key just to be able to select all of them. And once they're all selected, what I'm going to do here is go up to the main menu, go to photo, go to photo merge, and then go to HDR. 
Now by default, Lightroom is going to auto merge these different stacks into a single HDR image each. And from here, we'll be able to edit these HDR shots to become our final real estate images. Now this often takes a bit of time to run, so we're going to come back once it's complete. Also, if you're keeping Lightroom open, you will sort of see it making progress and the different images getting darker and lighter as it merges the shots to become an HDR image. So I would just let it do its thing and monitor the progress up top to ensure it's complete before you do any further editing. All right, so now that Lightroom has completed the HDR merge, there is a couple things we'll still want to do, before we start editing these photos. So as you're going to see for each of these images, what Lightroom has done is basically have the original stack of images, whether the JPEG files or RAW files, then you're going to see next to it the HDR image. In this case, we just want to work with the HDR images here going forward. And so for a quick trick on how we can kind of filter out these stacks of images, what I'll often do here is for the library filter, go over to text and just basically make sure that I am only looking at those images with HDR in them. And what you're going to see Lightroom did for each of these stacks of images it made is take the original first image stack name from whatever the file was on the card that we pulled and append HDR to it. So basically any HDR image Lightroom created has HDR in the name and just by filtering on that alone, we'll only be working with the HDR images. Now, if there's one thing I want to particularly stress, once you've stacked and HDR merged your images, your images are still far from being good to go. Truthfully, there aren't a ton of major edits we're going to necessarily need to do, but some of these different corrections we're going to make are going to be crucial in terms of how much better they're going to make these images look. Now, one thing I will mention here is that you do have the ability to select auto adjustments in Lightroom. And sometimes this may help in terms of getting accurate exposure or say accurate white balance by using the dropper. But I find this to be a bit hit or miss at times. And so you're going to see me actually go through the process of how I would manually adjust exposure here and sort of correct white balance given what we shot. Because I think having a bit of an eye for this and not just trusting Lightroom in some of these cases is going to be pretty important as you start to work on and edit different photos. So first and foremost, I want to cover the different exterior shots that we've selected and we have a number of them here. So let's just go through them and I'm gonna show you some different tips and tricks I would typically do when editing exterior shots. So first up is this house where we took some JPEG photos and you can see just with the HDR merge how underexposed it actually made the home. And you can tell this is heavily underexposed just by looking at the histogram here, which shows the image severely skewed to the left. Whereas if it were skewed to the right, it would be heavily overexposed and somewhere in the middle, maybe even a little over or under is going to be the sweet spot in terms of where we want general exposure. So I'm just going to go and play with the exposure here to bring this to a level where I think this should be. Again, this looks around relatively exposed at a regular level. I'm going to play around with the highlights here as well and trying to brighten the image. Again, not too much perhaps. I'm going to just kind of look at the whites and the blacks and see what this does as we play with it. Of course, that looks a bit blown out. And just by tinkering with things here, we're getting to a point to see what this could look like. From here, I might also play with the contrast and you can see it looks a little flat if I pull it out too much, but might look a little dark too if I push that too much. So I'm gonna say somewhere in and around there looks decent. One thing I'm also going to play around with is the white balance here just to see what this looks like. Of course, too cool, it looks a bit there, but too warm, it might look a bit extreme. Now, because I've been messing with it, if I do Command Z, that's going to undo what I just did. And you're going to see where the white balance sits currently. I'm gonna try maybe around 6,000 just to see what this looks like. And I do like some of the warmth this has, though I do feel the highlights are a bit bright. So I'm going to tone that down a bit. And I'm gonna maybe bring this down to around 5750 just so it gets a bit cooler. That's not too bad. So one of the things I'm noticing here is this patch of grass sort of by the sidewalk. So I'm going to use the brush tool to either try to heal or clone the section of grass, depending on which I think works better. We'll just give these a try. So I'm going to select the brush tool right over here and it is already set to heal. So we're going to leave this and all of kind of the standard settings as they are. And right now I can kind of see the pattern and the thickness of the brush, though it's a bit hard here on the grass, but this pretty much matches up with the strip. And if we need to shrink it or make it any bigger or smaller, we can do that later. So what I'm going to do is hold down the shift key here and just as I do that kind of select an area of this patch and just kind of drag it across the grass here as delicately as I can that's pretty decent and for whatever reason right now it's pulling from the house we don't want to do that but I'm going to just pick a section of grass here and right now I'm not thrilled with the results I'm getting, so I'm gonna try clone instead. So if I instead try clone here, this looks actually a lot better. So I'm just gonna maybe see if there's maybe a better selection of grass that looks a bit deeper. I like that, I think that looks pretty decent. Now there's a couple other key things we're going to want to do to this image as well, which I'll show you in a moment here. I'm going to want to zoom out just to get the full image in frame here. I wanna make sure and go down to enable profile corrections. So this is going to see that I shot this with my 20 millimeter G lens. And what you're going to see here is that it removes any distortion or vignetting that's going on, which you'll typically have happen with wide angle lenses anyway, so it corrected that. The other thing we're going to do is here in the sort of upright section, I'm going to basically let Lightroom sort of auto reorient the photo to make sure it's lined up properly, both vertically and horizontally. 
So if I hit auto, that's the result it gives me there, which pretty much levels out the home to where it should be. Now, if I choose level instead, you'll see this somewhat also does it, but just orients it differently. I kind of actually like the results level gives here, so I'm going to leave it at that. But if I do decide I want this cropped in a bit more to get rid of some of the other homes, I can adjust this quickly as well. So if I go up to the crop overlay setting here and I just select that, I could now maybe drag this so I get just a little bit less of the image there. Maybe get a little bit here. This is relatively in center. Maybe we'll try to frame the home up a bit more in the center here as well. Something like that. And just hit the enter key. Now again, there's a number of other things I could do here to clean this image up if I wanted to, but I want to just basically get this image in a more ready to go state. And I think there's only one thing I need to do to be able to sort of complete that in this case. What I'm going to do is right click this image and I'm going to do edit in and we're going to go to Photoshop 2022. All right, so I mentioned earlier that I didn't particularly like the sky in this photo, so I want to do a sky replacement on this. And for this, really Photoshop is going to be the one place where we can do this easily. So this is pretty straightforward. From here, I'm just going to go to edit, and then we're going to go to, yes, sky replacement. Photoshop is going to auto-select the sky region without us really doing anything. And we should be able to pick one of the default sky values to replace the cloudy one with, so it looks maybe a little bluer, a little brighter, and so on. Now right now this is set for sort of a sunset type of setting. I'm gonna go down and choose blue skies instead and just play around with some of these and see what they look like. That one's not bad. I actually do happen to like that one. I'm going to see what else we can do with this. Maybe I make it a bit brighter, something like that. Maybe I bring the temperature down to give it a little more blue, maybe a little less there. And I think that looks fine. So we'll hit okay here. And then I'm going to just do save. Now once we go back to Lightroom here, you'll see we have both the edited image, which shows HDR-edit and is a TIFF file. So this shows what we edited in Photoshop with the sky replacement just a moment ago. And then we have sort of the original stacked image that we were working with in Lightroom before we adjusted the sky. To make sure I export the right one, what I'm going to do here is just right click on this particular photo set flag, and I'm going to set this to be flagged. Basically, in the end, I'm going to just export our flagged photos. So once we flag the ones that are ready to go, we're basically making a marker for ourselves so we know what we want to export at the very end. All right, so let's work with some more daytime exteriors. I'm going to go over to one of our other photos here, which you can see is of a different house. And pretty similarly, you can tell we'll want to adjust the exposure here as well, at the very least. So again, our histogram looks a bit off, but once I sort of start to balance this out, this looks a bit more normal and a bit more where we want it to be. One thing I'm also going to do is change the color profile here, which is going to give us these options by default because it's a raw photo. You'll notice with the JPEGs, they were a bit more contrasty and punchy by default because these JPEGs are taking the actual color profile that they were shot in in camera in my Sony a7 IV. So in this case for raw photos, I typically prefer using the Adobe landscape profile just for real estate. I think they give a nice, really kind of contrasty and punchy image that looks good here. And again, you can see, I think that looks a lot better just if we compare even the before and after raising exposure and just changes in color profile has a huge difference just doing that. Again, I'm gonna sort of look here what it looks like if we kind of roll out some of the shadow details, maybe bring up the highlights, play around with the whites and blacks a bit. Again, nothing super scientific here, just kind of playing with what I think might look good. One thing I've also noticed over time is that Sony auto white balance tends to look a bit cool. So I often find myself warming up some of these images, particularly with exteriors. So again, even where this is currently, I'm gonna kind of raise this and I think that looks pretty good in and around there. You can certainly tell if I go too far, I think it looks a bit too warm. Certainly too cool looks a bit much, so I think around 6,500 or so looks good. Again, I definitely want to apply some profile corrections here so that it removes any vignetting or distortion. And I'm going to try the upright settings just to ensure this frames up the photo properly. And you can see that frames it up, I think, a lot better than it did before. Though I am finding it looking a bit unbalanced in the crop. So what I'm going to do here is again, go into sort of our crop overlay, and I'm going to just maybe kind of shorten that up here so it shows up a bit nicer. Maybe drag this down somewhere like that. Go with that. I think that looks a bit better. Now again, I'm not particularly thrilled with our sky, so let's do a quick sky replacement on this. I'm going to right click, edit in Adobe Photoshop. And once we're in Photoshop, let's do a sky replacement. We'll go to edit and sky replacement. And once that generates, we should see what that looks like. And it looks a little dark for my taste. 
So I think I definitely want to raise the brightness of that, maybe bring in the color a bit more as well. Again, I'm going to just save this and close out Photoshop. And again, coming back into Lightroom, now we have our finished photo. I might play with the white balance just a little bit more to warm it up ever so slightly. Now you can also see if I use the white balance dropper here just to sort of double check that, or maybe to more accurately let Lightroom select this if I pick what it looks to be a white area. So we're going to say that, maybe try even another one. This is pretty much pinning it in a similar spot, so not too different looking and I think we're pretty much okay. And yeah, I think this looks pretty good. Now, one thing you can do is make presets in Lightroom so that if you have a lot of standard changes you typically make to photos, you can pretty much universally apply a preset to all the different photos you bring in. If you'd like to see that covered in a future video, definitely let me know. But one thing you can also often do is basically just copy your settings from one photo to another, whether one photo or many photos, if you want to universally apply a given look that you like. And so that can save you a lot of time in editing as well. So even though we flagged the one photo with the sky replacement, I'm going to go to the one that we we didn't just to show that and what we're going to do is command shift C and this is going to allow us to copy all the different settings we set here for this over to another photo now, in this case I can also say enable profile corrections because I know I shot this with the same lens I'm not going to utilize the crop here because I might want to keep that photo as is and not necessarily crop it but basically any color or other types of adjustments I can bring right over and that should save me some time as well so I'm going to hit copy now, if I look at this next photo I want to apply it to, you can see it looks a bit dark, a bit underexposed, not necessarily what I want. So again, now I'm going to do just Command V and you'll see instantly the color improved and a lot of other things did as well. And that's because we brought those settings right over from the previous photo. So that just saved us a bunch of time with editing that. In this case, what I do want to do is definitely try the upright setting to auto align this because I think this could be a bit better. And again, I'm not particularly thrilled with how this is positioned currently. So I'm going to crop this a bit as well. In fact, I may even go a bit tighter here as well. And I think that's okay right here. One cool trick I wanna show here is with the clone tool, which I'm going to use in a slightly unexpected way, you might say. So what you can see here, if I zoom in on the stores, I see not only a reflection of a car that was out in the street, but even a little bit of myself. And I kind of wanna change this a bit. So let's go over again to the spot removal option we have here. I'm going to use the clone option. So I'm gonna use the clone tool here. I'm just going to hold the shift key down as much as I can, or I think I need to. Drag that down a bit. All right, I'm just gonna kind of play with this a bit just to see what I can get here. I'll scape that out. I'll maybe zoom out a bit. And you can see that actually looks a lot better just really quickly trying to remove the reflection from the glass there. So certainly not perfect, but when zoomed out from afar, can't really see it and definitely looks a lot less visible now. All right, so now let's try some of these twilight shots that were actually taken during in and around sunset and show how we might handle a photo like that depending on a few different factors. So I'm going to go back to our first house here, which has this sort of photo right here. And you can see there's actually, I would say a lot that I wanna correct with this, but let's just first get it to where I think it needs to be exposure wise. So of course this is pretty dark. So what I want to do is first just brighten this up a bit. I wanna see if maybe I wanna bring some highlights back to this. Definitely the color temperature looks really cool here. So I wanna see if I can warm this up a bit to maybe get it looking a bit more normal. That tends to look, I would say, a bit better there. And we have kind of the warm glow going on from the lights. I'm just kind of playing around with the contrast here to see what we can do. I think that's okay. Noticing the lights are a little orange, so I might take some of that out in the saturation. If we go down here, so maybe take out a little bit of that orange just to make it a little less. Maybe kick in a little more yellow there. Maybe kick out a little more orange, maybe kick in a little more yellow, add a little back in, that's not bad. Now again, I'm noticing some patchy areas of grass, so I probably want to fix that. Though I first wanna also crop this shot because the angle definitely looks a bit off from where this was taken. So we're going to go into, again, profile corrections, straighten that out. So we go into crop overlay here. I'm definitely going to kind of peel this up a bit and try to get the house maybe a bit more in center, something sort of like that. I think that looks a lot better. There's still an area of grass I wanna fix. So again, if we go into the spot removal tool, what I can do here is, let's say maybe we do a heel. So I'm going to just do basically kind of a selection here on the grass, just right there. Let's see where that takes it from. It takes it from right there. I do wanna bring this over a bit to make sure it takes it from the right section. Once I escape that, that looks pretty good right there. So you can see the spot removal tool is actually really effective just with kind of fixing grass on the fly or even taking out a reflection if you need to. Very useful. I'm not liking the sky. So again, this is definitely going to be a candidate for sky replacement and probably a different looking sky given the sort of twilight shot we're going for. So again, we will edit in Photoshop. And in this case, edit, 
do a sky replacement. And even though it's going to load the sky we just tried, I'm going to actually try a different one. So let's go down now instead of to the blue skies. What I want to instead try is some of our sunset skies. So maybe something like this. That looks pretty nice. I'm gonna try just a couple others. See what I think. That's a little much. It's a little bright. A little dramatic for what I'm going for. Yeah, and I'm gonna go back to that. I think that looks fine. Not sure I even want to correct anything else here, so frankly, I'm just gonna save it, go back. And again, I think that looks pretty nice, all things considered. All right, now let's edit some photos that were taken from a larger condo complex that are going to look a bit different that we might want to handle in a slightly different way. Okay, and so here we have the building in this complex. Again, a lot of different things we could do here or things that I would change. I wanna first switch this to Adobe Landscape, so you can see just the difference here alone. If I hit the backslash key, the pop in color is dramatic. And the exposure level, of course, is also dramatic. Something I haven't mentioned up to this point that I also sometimes do is just to hit the auto button. You'll notice that when you switch the color profile, it also handles the auto adjustment when you do that. So bear in mind, if you do switch the color profile, it's automatically adjusting exposure to where it thinks it should be. Again, I maybe want things a bit brighter, not too much though. Wanna maybe play around with the highlights here. Again, maybe give the whites a bit of a punch. I also definitely want to warm this up a bit, I think, compared to where it is currently. So just kind of playing around with where I think this should be. I'm going to say maybe in and around there. Definitely going to want to apply profile corrections for our lens. You'll see that fixes things there. And this is also a shot that's definitely tough to get any verticals vertical because of how tall the building is. So I want to just see what Adobe can do in terms of correcting that. If we do the auto adjustment here, you'll see Adobe substantially adjusted the photo here. So to sort of highlight the difference here, that's with it off. That's with the auto adjustment. That's a huge improvement. So we're going to leave that. Now I could get clever with trying to frame out some of this, as you can see, sort of construction equipment, because you can tell there's buildings under construction in the back here, but I'm just going to leave that as is. I think it's okay. But yes, we're going to do a sky replacement on this. So we'll go to edit in Photoshop, and we'll do an edit sky replacement. And here I'm going to just look at some of the different sunset options that we have to see if one of these might end up fitting the image well with what we're looking for. Looks a bit brighter, looks a bit nicer. Maybe we make it a bit brighter. Maybe we make the temperature cooler, maybe warmer, maybe warmer, something like that. All right, and so we'll flag that because we like it. Now I'm not gonna show me editing every possible exterior here that we brought in, but what you're going to notice is that basically we would apply the same exact principles to some of these other photos as I sort of speed through these, mainly adjusting exposure to make sure the histogram is at least relatively balanced, adjusting the white balance a bit, maybe picking a different color profile if we so choose, or adjusting different parts of the saturation if we want a certain color to pop a bit more or a bit less, doing profile corrections to ensure any lens distortion or vignetting is taken care of, adjusting the leveling, and or crop of the image so that this frames up relatively evenly and sort of matches with the typical rule of thirds grid that we'd have. Doing some minor repairs with clone and or heel, say with grass or other different surfaces when and where we think this is applicable. And yes, at least in some cases doing a sky replacement. This is pretty much my general approach for any quick turnaround exterior real estate shot. But now let's look at some interior shots and see what we might do to treat some of these. And there are definitely some different tips, tricks, and techniques we'll want to do on interiors that maybe we didn't necessarily think of or apply for the case of exteriors. All right, so let's start back at our initial house that we started with in the first place. As you can see here, this is just a standard dining room shot, and this definitely looks well underexposed. So I'm going to just try to bring the exposure back here so this looks a bit more normal, maybe something in and around that area. I'm going to probably bring the whites down as well, and also the highlights, just to be able to even this out a bit so we can again raise the exposure a bit more. This is a common trick I will often do. This is definitely looking a bit warm or yellow, so I think I want to cool this room down a bit slightly, at least compared to where it sits presently. I'm not sure I even have a white surface I could target anyway, so I'm just gonna kind of cool this based on what I'm seeing. That looks pretty decent. Again, we're going to go down to profile corrections here. And you'll see if I use the auto option here, I'm really not liking how that's framing it up, even if it thinks that is level. So if I try just the main level option, that seems to orient it just the way I want it. So there are a number of ways we can adjust window exposure or what's sometimes also called a window pull. I'm gonna actually cover a few different ways you might be able to approach this depending on what type of shot you're working in. And so let's just cover at least one of these here. This is sort of a trick I would say that I've used before. So one of the things you can often do is use the masking tool here to just select a given part of the image. What I'm going to do here is actually select just a color range. And you'll notice I'll say this because I noticed that the general color area of this window and the light it's bringing in is definitely 
lot cooler than that of the room. So if I select this, you can pretty much tell Adobe with its mask has selected all the different color here that I think is being brought in from the windows and its natural light. So a couple of things I can do if I want to. I can choose to bring down the exposure on this if I want to make it look a little bit more recovered or sort of bring back the room to some extent. Another thing I can also do is of course change the temperature. So obviously you can see it's very cool now. That looks even worse and more cool. But if I start to bring this back and make it look a bit warmer, that now starts to match the room relatively and look a bit more natural. And I would say that looks pretty good without even doing what I would call a proper window pull in this case. I may want to adjust the color of the lights a bit, so I will choose a new mask. So again, I'm going to select a new mask here and I'm going to actually do just a luminance range here and try these light bulbs. I'm selecting a little bit more than I wanted, but I think that's okay. I want to try playing with, in this case, some of the color and just bring down some of what I think need. Maybe take out some of the yellow and orange. That looks pretty good here. One thing I could now just kind of do is go back to the regular image. Maybe warm this temperature up slightly just to make it a bit warmer. And I think that's a decent looking image. So we'll flag this. So now we'll move on to another room here. And as you can definitely see, this exposure is what I would call way off. So we're going to bring this up significantly. And as you can see, when we do this, this definitely blows out the window highlights. But again, one thing we can do, bring our highlights down and yes, bring our whites down as well. So this is going to recover a fair amount. Maybe bring our exposure back a bit, but also maybe sort of peel back some of the blacks. Maybe increase the shadows there. We might cool this room down a bit just to look a bit more natural. We'll see. Okay. Again, we're going to enable profile corrections here just to fix that. I'm going to try just doing the upright tool to select the room. That looks a bit much and punches in more than I want, but if I do level, that seems to be okay. Exposure's looking a bit hot, so I'm gonna bring that down a bit. That looks a bit more reasonable. Now for this example, I'm going to do an actual more proper window pull. And in this case, a lot of times window pulls you'll see will often be done with the original bracketed layered images in Photoshop. And this involves a bit more work and finessing sometimes. So there is an even quicker way I like and now prefer to do this in Lightroom for again, sort of quick delivery interior photos. And I'm going to show you how you can approach this as well. So I'm going to hit the K key here just to bring up the brush option. I'm going to change the density over to 100. I'm going to keep feather down at around zero. And the size I'm going to make at least a little bit bigger for right now. Maybe a little smaller than that. But I'm going to adjust the exposure so that it goes all the way down and you will see why in a moment here. So if I bring down the exposure pretty much all the way, going to sort of paint in this window area here. At least roughly. I might also even raise the temperature on this just so it looks a bit warmer. We'll see if we want to do that or not. Now what I'm going to do is basically do the inverse of this using the erase tool and clear out some of what we just masked out. And then using our same brush size here, you can see sort of where the brush ends at that line. I'm going to bear that in mind. Okay, so now I'm going to hit the erase tool. And what you're going to see here is, it should let me pretty much pick a point. And if I hold the shift key down, then drag it down, and then go there, that should now erase some of what we were doing. So again, going to go there. kind of erase that out. And I'm going to actually change the brush size here to make it a little finer. Again, I'm going to adjust the size a bit here, maybe make it a bit smaller. And I'm going to turn on auto mask here just to try to clean this up a bit because some of these edges are a bit tough to define. I'm gonna turn off auto mask. Again, I'm gonna go with auto mask here to try to clean this up. This is definitely a tough one. to go back into K and I'm thinking this looks a little dark so I'm just gonna actually kind of bring the exposure back a bit just to think it looks a little bit better brighter maybe something like that I'm gonna drag this over just to clean this up a bit more we're going to do erase I will again do auto mask for at least this chair here because it's a bit weird and you're seeing it's doing a pretty good job at least with covering the exposure for the chair
And now you can see once we've zoomed back out, we basically recovered the exposure from the window. Now again, there's other ways to do this that involve Photoshop and adjusting the actual layers of the HDR photo. I do think this option tends to work okay, though I would also say window pulls are sort of a mixed bag. I know some realtors don't actually like these and think they look a bit unnatural, and that can also be the case with certain buyers. And in fact, a lot of photos I've delivered have been corrected more on the line of the first photo I showed you rather than this case where I'm trying to do a full exposure recovery of the window. And as you see in this example, what can sometimes be difficult is when you have a window with a lot of lights in it. And this is not L-I-G-H-T-S, but rather L-I-T-E-S. These are the little dividers and panes of glass within a window that sort of break the window up and give it some visual distinction. A lot of times you'll find window pulls where these lights and these lines between the windows are just sort of left as is and not recovered necessarily. That's a pretty standard thing I've seen in a lot of real estate photos. And so I would say play around with these different techniques and see what works for you. All right, so let's move on to another photo here. All right, so for this interior shot, because we haven't shown yet enough different ways you can do window window pulls and sort of recover exposure there. What I'm going to do is now show you what is typically known as the proper way that involves Photoshop in terms of doing window pulls and recovering exposure. Something I'll also say is that I like the Adobe color profile for raw photos when it comes to interiors. So first things first here, I'm just going to kind of adjust exposure, see what this looks like. Not too bad. I might adjust white balance and see what this looks like with the dropper. And I do not like that at all, so we're going to undo that. Again, sort of proving my earlier point here about how I don't always trust Lightroom with this. I actually think white balance is probably okay, but what I might do is sort of just roll down the whites, maybe roll down the highlights, and then just generally boost exposure. So we get sort of a warmer, softer look for the room. Again, I'm going to adjust Enable profile corrections here. We're going to also do just the auto adjustment. I think that looks good. Could maybe roll out a bit of the yellow here as well if I want, sort of make this room look a bit more neutral. Maybe something like that makes it look a little bit cleaner. So now here's what I'm going to do to do a proper window pull that involves Photoshop. I'm going to go back to my library here and just make sure that in my collections, I'm going to go back to where I pulled this photo from. So as you can see here, we have everything here in the original stack. So if I expand this stack here, I'm just going to look at some of the darker exposed photos. I think that looks okay. I'm going to just pull this out and kind of pull it to the side there. And so you can see we expanded my stack here so I can work with that underexposed version of the photo. Now, if I go to look at this in the develop pane, you're going to see the crop. Some other things have been adjusted since I started working on this. So what I'm going to do here is actually just go back to the photo I was working on. Go do Command Shift C, and again, pretty much copy all these different things over. I'm going to undo some of these changes. We'll, we'll undo the color grading. But we'll also copy over the transformations. I think that should be good. Now we go over here. We're going to paste these on by Command V, and okay, now, our two frames should line up correctly. And now once I've selected these two, I'm going to right click and we're going to do edit in. We're going to open as layers in Photoshop in this case. And so in this case, you see we have the two layers of the photo here. What I'm going to do is actually just drag this one on top to make it the main. You'll see what we're going to do. We're going to basically cut out the exposure from this main photo so that the underlying layer and its exposure of the window is what's present. All right, so what we're going to do is use the lasso tool to kind of frame out our window here. Now, normally you can do this by just basically picking a point, holding down the option key on your Mac or alt key on your PC, and then dragging, and this will allow you to get a straight line on the window rather than just kind of a freeform tool, which the lasso is by default. So again, let me zoom in on the window here. I'm going to just kind of drag up, go back to our lasso tool. I will find a point on this window that seems reasonable. Click a point here, hold down the option key and let go. And now this should let us just kind of work around the window. Gonna probably not worry about these window latches, at least for now. And then we'll do just Command X to remove this. And we have the window back. Let's do the same down there. All right, so let's add an adjustment layer just to fix the exposure a bit here. I'm going to do layer, new adjustment layer. We'll do exposure. I'll say that's fine. I'll put that there. And then you'll see where we have this, of course, it is 
above the actual underexposed one, but below the main image. So we're only adjusting exposure for that. So I don't know, maybe something like that. And if we zoom out, that actually looks pretty good. Now, of course, we could have been a bit more fine grained with how we crop this with the window latches, but I'm going for expediency here in this case, so I think that's a sufficient example. In this case, we'll save, go back into Lightroom, and as you'll see, we have our finished example with the proper window pull. So we'll flag this. Now let's do one other example of an interior just to show a couple of other different tricks. I'm going to choose this kitchen here from a newer apartment and we'll go to the develop tool here. Again, exposure looks a little bit dark, so I'm going to brighten it, but we're going to also lower the highlights here and bring down the whites so that's a little bit less extreme and then maybe raise our overall relative exposure. Again, sort of just eyeballing this in this case. If I adjust the color temperature a bit, and I'm kind of playing around with it, but we can do a dropper. I think these cabinets are pretty white. So that looks a bit cool to my particular taste. So I'm gonna actually just warm it up a little bit. Also, again, we'll just do some profile corrections here, which you can see makes a difference. And we'll do our auto adjustment, which I think levels that out a bit more, you can see. Now, one thing I notice here is the fact that there is a slightly different color cast with the light under the oven here compared to the main light in the room. And so I might want to adjust this just to kind of round that out a bit. In this case, I'm going to go over to the masking tool here and just select a brush and just kind of paint a little bit of this area here. Something like that, maybe also a bit under the microwave here. In this case, I just want to round out the yellow from this. So if I want, I'll go down to the saturation, bring down the yellow a bit. That light under the oven actually looks a lot more natural and a bit more white compared to what it did beforehand. Maybe take out some of the orange as well. And I think that looks pretty good. And again, I'm not going to cover every single interior edit, but basically following a lot of these same rules and principles. Again, usually adjusting exposure and or white balance to some extent, usually rolling down the highlights and or whites to get a bit more dynamic range within the image, enabling profile corrections and doing a level or upright adjustment to align the image properly, doing some form of window pull, using either a luminance mask to try to recover the window and or its color temperature through one of a couple ways, using the command K brush trick to bring down exposure and light room and then clean up the different edges and sides and or lights within the window or using the classic photoshop technique of lassoing out the different part of your image with a couple of different layers and basically cutting out your image so that the underexposed layer is shown for the window and then maybe removing any more direct color cast through either a mask of some sort this is usually what's going to encompass your interior image edits and of course once you've done this you can flag these and you're ready to export so to round this whole thing out once we're ready to export as you can see here i'm back in the library view i'm going to do here is actually clear my previous filter which I've had to actually clear a couple of times here anyway I'm going to go down to our filter down below and just make sure that I choose flagged for this and so because I have all the photos I want to export basically flagged at this point and I've filtered this on flagged what I'm going to do is just do command a to select everything here and then I'm going to go to export so what I'm going to first do is pick a specific folder where I want these exported to which in this case will be this little final folder. I will normally name them something relevant to the property that I'm shooting. So either the address or the sort of abbreviated form of the address. In this case, we'll just say real estate samples. And I usually let Lightroom enumerate this. So it will start at one and just count down from there with all the different exported images. Now, a lot of these defaults are going to be fine, but if there is one thing I will typically change and I like the image format as JPEG, the color space is fine. I will generally limit the size here. At least in the US, the MLS or multiple listing service where all of these different homes end up getting listed across all the different websites that buyers view them on typically has a maximum file size as far as I know of, I believe 20 megabytes. And so to make sure none of these photos hit that cap or go a bit above that, I will usually limit the exported file size to 12 megabytes. So in this case, as you can see, it's set to 12,000K, which is 12 megabytes. I will let it sharpen for the screen. And pretty much, I don't think I need to touch just about anything else. And I will just hit export. And Lightroom might give you a warning here in terms of the exporting size, but I would generally ignore this and just hit continue. 
and we'll let Lightroom do its thing. And of course, once Lightroom finishes the export, you finally have your finished images. So you've selected the gear that you need for shooting real estate, you've adjusted your camera to accommodate all of the different settings, you've gone out and shot some photos using the different tips and tricks recommended, and you've now gone through the process of editing them. Basically, at this point, you've now seen end-to-end -end what you can do to shoot real estate photography, and hopefully this is something that you can start doing today. Now, even though I haven't edited this video yet, I can assure you this is going to be by far the longest video that is on my channel up to this point. And putting together a full-blown tutorial like this definitely took a fair amount of time to craft and consider all the different things to talk about. So I would definitely appreciate if you would leave a like and subscribe if this was of any use to you. Also, please feel free to leave any questions or any thoughts you have in the comments below. Do you like long-form tutorials like this? Do you have other content you'd like to see me cover around real estate, whether photography or videography related, or just other things around photo and video in general? I have some pretty cool things planned on this channel coming up in the future, so definitely let me know because I'm curious to hear them. For now, and yes, I know that was a lot, that is all I have to say, so thanks for watching.